So, welcome to the second institute lecture of this academic session. Today, it is our pleasure to have Professor K. P. Mohanan with us to deliver this institute lecture. Now, may I request our director to formally welcome Professor Mohanan. Thank you, sir. Before we start with this institute lecture, I would like to give a brief introduction about today's speaker. <laughs> Professor Mohan is a co founder of Think, it is an internationally well known theoretical linguist with a passion for education and a deep interest in basis for beliefs across disciplines. After a PhD from MIT in 1982, he taught at the University of Texas Austin, MIT, Stanford University and the National University of Singapore before joining ISER Pune faculty in January 2011, where he continued his work till he retired at the end of 2016. He has made significant contributions to linguistic theory in the areas of phonology, syntax and morphology. Along with Tara Mohanan, he was the architect of an inquiry oriented undergraduate program in linguistics at National University of Singapore. His more recent academic interests include scientific inquiry and the nature of academic knowledge and inquiry in general against the backdrop of human beliefs. Drawing on his experience as a researcher and educationist and his thinking on academic knowledge and inquiry, he is currently preoccupied with developing systems and resource materials to nurture in students the capacity for critical thinking and inquiry. With this brief introduction, now I welcome Professor Mohanan to deliver his institute lecture titled Education to Enhance Academic Intelligence. Professor Mohanan. This is probably somewhat unusual. I do not use a PowerPoint uh, projection. I do not normally give lectures. I have conversations and this is a good way of having a conversation. So, I want to begin by asking you a question. Why are you here? And when I say why are you here, I do not mean why are you here in this auditorium. What I mean is, why are you here in this institution of higher education? Don't, you do not have to answer, but you know, think about that question. The answers could be because my parents wanted me to be here. I am talking to students, I know why the faculty is here, I am talking about the students. Or it could be, I want to have a good job and this is the only way to have a good job. And there could be some other reasons. I am interested in X. But what is your reason uh, for uh, coming here? And I want to follow it up with another question. Why do we have the system of formal education? Why do parents send their children to school when they could be playing outside? Suppose you shut down this institution of formal education. Would something go wrong? What is the purpose of formal education? These are not easy questions to answer, but keep those questions in mind. And there are various reasons, various purposes that people have uh, suggested for having this institution of formal education, schools, colleges, universities, etc., etc. And they include the following answers. For most parents that I have talked to, Education is a means to financial prosperity. You want to have a good job and you go through this, it does not matter what the education system gives you. Maybe they will teach you how to remember telephone directories, does not matter. If you are good at that, you get a good job, that is all that matters. Another answer is the uh, people who call themselves academics, people like me want other academics to join them, to become specialists. So, you need these institutions to 
may convert students into specialists. So, this is a way of self-replication, self-replication. It's a form of academic reproduction. But there can be other, many other possible answers. And I'm not going to tell you what my answer is. You can probably infer what my answer is towards the end of this talk. Now, before I proceed to the concept of academic intelligence, I want to briefly summarize the gist of my talk yesterday. This was on uh, learning how to construct theories as part of research. And this is what uh, we jointly came up with, the people in the talk and me. And the idea was research. Research is a process. And that process leads to the outcome academic knowledge as the uh, outcome. <clears throat> this is my attempt at my best possible handwriting. I hope it is legible to you there. I am in my best behavior because of this projection. Um, as the dimensions of academic knowledge as a special case of knowledge, um, we should discuss the concept of intelligence. So we can talk about, for example, bacterial intelligence, chimpanzee intelligence, and human intelligence. As a general concept of intelligence, intelligence as a mental capacity to do things. Human intelligence is a special case of intelligence. And you might ask, but do bacteria have minds? There was a time when we thought, no, they don't have minds because they don't have nervous system. And to have minds, you need the nervous system. But that is no longer the view that many scientists hold. So you can have plant cognition. There is a, there is a field called neurocognitive, cognitive neuroscience of plants. Obviously, plants don't have neurons. So you have to interpret it differently. And if you accept those, you can talk about bacterial minds and chimpanzee minds and human minds and human intelligence being a special case of intelligence in general. And then you can say academic intelligence is a special case of human intelligence that is associated with academic knowledge. So academic intelligence, you can say, is the ability to communicate, to use, to acquire, to create, and evaluate academic knowledge. That's a special kind of intelligence that you get through formal education. So let me write that down as to to communicate, to use, to acquire, generate, and evaluate uh, academic knowledge, which is the outcome of research. This is how the two concepts are created. And you might ask, but then research is something that is done by professionals, people who are at the, or in higher education, people who are doing their PhD or after their PhD. Can beginners have academic intelligence? And my answer is yes. You can develop academic intelligence in students right from beginning. So I teach a course on that for sixth grade students for first year undergraduate students, but of course the levels will be different. This is like saying you can teach mathematics for uh, class 1 students, class 6 students, class 10 students, graduate students, and the level will be different. 
but the basic idea is the core will be the same. And as part of the concept of knowledge, yesterday we talked about the different uh, dimensions. Of, academ of uh, academic knowledge, one of the dimensions is information. Information is a fragment of knowledge. So if you, if you come to know that uh, a right angle triangle is a triangle in which there is a right angle, that's a piece of information. Information need not be connected to other pieces of information. It's, it's uh, if you go to a the information counter in a railway station and ask them when does such and such particular train leave and what the person tells you is information. And this is one particular kind of knowledge but then this information is structured in a certain way. That information is integrated, unified, has some kind of coherence. So structured information is what we often mean by knowledge. And that structured information gives you a sense of understanding. So if you go to a railway station counter and ask, when does this train leave and you get an answer, there is nothing to understand, it's just a piece. Understanding means connecting, integrating, and having that sense of unity in the different pieces of information. That's what we call understanding and closely related word that people use is that of beauty. So theorists quite often talk about the beauty of a theory. Mathematicians talk about the beauty of a proof. That beauty comes from the structuring of knowledge in a certain way. How the different pieces fit together into a unified whole. And another important characteristic of uh, knowledge is uh, credibility. That is the sense that what you are given as knowledge is true. So truth is an important consideration of knowledge. You might understand the geocentric theory, but you may not believe it to be true. And if you don't believe it to be true, then that is not part of your knowledge. So, subscribing to the truth of a proposition or a configuration of propositions as an important part of knowledge. So, this is about the concept of knowledge, the concept of academic knowledge. This is not necessarily part of knowledge in general, like pragmatic knowledge, knowledge of uh, knowledge that if you uh, boil milk with some drop of lemon in it, it will split. That's kind of pragmatic knowledge. And this is the part that we were talking about yesterday. How do you, how do you convert information into structured information such that you understand it and how do you evaluate that information and decide that it is true? This is an important part of research. The question is how do you do that? What are the processes that go into this structure and what are the tools of inquiry? The process of research, what do researchers do to construct academic knowledge and to evaluate the credibility of academic knowledge or what is given to you as academic knowledge? And this is, this is the, an important part of academic intelligence that can be developed in educational systems such that students become more intelligent, so to speak, through the use of these tools by learning the tools of inquiry. And the tools of inquiry you uh, include, but is not restricted to reasoning, uh, classification, clarification, which in some cases will be defining justification, 
explanation, debating, perceiving, or observing. So one can think about eight or ten or twelve tools of inquiry that go into the construction, evaluation of academic knowledge such that you are satisfied at the end that the structured information that you call knowledge is credible, is acceptable. And this process, the use of these tools is something that you can learn in secondary school, let alone undergraduate days. And the reason why I'm saying this is I've tried it out and students do become more intelligent. And this idea of education to increase academic intelligence is different from the concept of education as transferring knowledge. There is something that researchers or educators know and that knowledge has to be transferred to the younger generation and they should be trained to use that knowledge. That's a very narrow view of the function of education. This view of education as increasing, ac increasing academic intelligence in this sense, what I've sketched here, includes students acquiring knowledge, but it's much more than that. Okay, this is by way of introduction to the idea that an important function of formal education is enhancing the intelligence of the learners. This is just what I have said just now is simply some kind of abstraction and largely these words. Okay, so when I say something like reasoning, classification, critical thinking, I didn't put that in here. These are simply words without clear meanings and the meanings will emerge only when you go through actual examples. Okay. There are some uh, handouts of yesterday's talk distributed. If all of you have handouts, then we can look at the handouts and proceed. Otherwise, we can write down here what I want to say. How many people have handouts? Can you read? Okay. Um, so some of the ideas that I'm discussing will be there in the handouts, but it doesn't matter if you don't have access to a handout. We'll write down what's important on the whiteboard. So let's try this example to illustrate the difference between information and structured information resulting in understanding and truth. So tell me, now you'll have to speak, tell me things that you know about straight lines. What are the properties of straight lines? This is like a question, what are the properties of metals? What are the properties of uh, insects? What are the properties of water? What are the properties of some chemical? Doesn't matter. So the, what are the properties of X is a general question that applies to many things. And I'm picking straight lines as just one example. What are the properties of circle? What are the properties of uh, number 28? It doesn't matter. So tell me what you think are the properties. What do you know about straight lines is my question. You have to tell me. This, if this is going to be a conversation, you have to speak. Yeah. Straight lines? Only two points. Okay. So you're saying... I'm going to erase all this. Um, straight lines. Property one has two points. So are you saying that if there is a straight line AB, there are only two points in that straight line? Okay, you need only two points to make a straight line, all right? So, suppose I say, 
there is point A and there is point B, that's a straight line. Is that a straight line? Two, two points. You can make a straight line, okay. So, given any two points, you can make a straight line, okay. So, let me try doing that. I made a straight line, right? Shortest path, okay. So, you say this is not the shortest path, so, all right. Now, I am not going to ask you what you mean by the word, the term shortest path. I will ask that question maybe two weeks later if I meet you, but does not matter, this is okay. So, you can say a straight line is the shortest path, path between two points, okay. Now, textbooks define straight line, in fact, textbooks quite often define line as an infinite thing and uh, so on, but we are not going to go into those details. I, I will take this idea of straight line, namely a straight line segment is the shortest path between two points. What else do you know about straight lines? Yeah. It has a what? Constant slope, okay. Has a constant slope. Now, you are introducing terms like this, but I am assuming that what you mean is something like this. If you have a straight line, this has constant slope, but if you do this, then the slope changes, okay. These, these are things that need to be clarified further, but for now that is okay. What else do you know about straight lines? Okay, the, I would like people from there, okay, wait. Yeah, people from in the sitting in the front have an advantage. So, people at the very back. Sir, uh, every point is uh, something constant time the previous one. Sorry, say that again. Any point on the line uh -huh. is something constant that previous one point. Well, every point is lambda time agla point. Every point is. Um, it is a vector space. Every, I didn't hear everything that you said. It is a multiple of previous point. Multiple of? Previous point, lambda times. Are you saying every point f follows the previous point or something? Pardon me? Uh -huh. Huh. Oh, I see, okay. Okay. Well, this is not something that I would use, let us say, in a first year undergraduate course. So, let us restrict our attention to the, the people here, I am assuming, uh, are not below first year. So, I will keep it at that level, basic level of 10th grade if possible. So, let us not use vector space and notions like that. I do not know if vector space is taught in 10th grade and so on. So, let me, let me avoid technical stuff. Basic stuff that you remember from your secondary school. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh -huh. Okay. So what she's saying is uh, a straight line can be um, extended in either direction. Uh, to without meeting. So, if you take a straight line and extend it in this direction and this direction, it will never meet, all right. It is one dimensional. Um, I didn't, I didn't hear that. There's a mic coming. Yeah. Straight lines are onto relations. That is, their codomain is always equal to their range. Okay. I, I didn't understand what you're saying. So, <laughs> I'm going to skip that. Okay. 
I said, no technical stuff, nothing beyond template. Yeah. No? No breadth. Okay. So, one of the things, I'm not going to write anything more, but one of the things that you have to figure out is whether you're saying the same thing or not. All right. And that can mean that something like this, whether you say number four or whether you say number five, are you saying the same thing? If they're saying this, if, that, if the answer is yes, you're asserting the same proposition, not different propositions. The other thing is, can you derive one from the other? Can you derive, for example, 5 from 4 or 4 from 5? They don't mean the same thing, but there is a derivational relation. Okay? So, and this is important because for structuring information, there are two aspects of structuring information. One of them is conceptual. So, the propositions that you call information are conceptually related. They are connected. They are put together as an organic whole. The other is logical. And by that, what we mean is, the propositions have a set of, uh, can be classified as a set of premises, that is initial propositions, the assumptions that you make, and there is a set of conclusions, and you can derive the conclusions from the premises through reasoning. That is the logical structure of knowledge, and you'll see this easily in a discipline like mathematics, where premises are called definitions and axioms or postulates. The distinction between axioms and postulates is not important for us now. And the conclusion is called a theorem. In science, the conclusion is called, instead of theorem, in science we call it a prediction. Oh, I'm a Sorry about lousy blackboard, whiteboard work. So both mathematics and science use this structure of premises and conclusions. In, in science, there is an additional requirement that the predictions that you make in your theory must match what you observe. Otherwise, math and science have the same structure of knowledge. And in addition, there is a condition that your axioms and definitions must be justified in science by showing that they are capable of explaining something. In mathematics, you don't have to justify your theory, you justify only your theorems. So, there are these minor differences between math and science, otherwise the core structure and the core tools of inquiry are the same. So, this is a, this is a simple example of creating knowledge. Okay. First, what we have done here is, we have listed bits of information and now we are trying to put that into this kind of structure. I haven't actually gotten you to construct that structure. I simply said one of the pieces of that construction has to do with putting them into this kind of premises conclusion structure. So, what that means is you have to identify what you want to take in this set as premises and what you want to take as theorems. It is up to you. There are different ways of doing it, but you choose the best way of dividing up the information into axioms, definitions and theorems. But once you say that something is a theorem, then you have to prove it. And this is something that can be done in, let us say, in the ninth grade. Sixth grade might be a little uh, too difficult, but it can be done in the ninth grade. And if you do that, students learn how to construct theories. A theory of straight lines, for example. 
Once students have constructed a theory of straight lines, you can then proceed to get them construct a theory of triangles. You can ask students, what are the properties of triangles? What do you know about triangles? And you make a list, a random list. So you can say something like triangles of three angles, three straight lines, and various other things. You know, for example, that the sum of angles in a triangle is two right angles. But then now you connect them, integrate them, unify them using this structure. Select some of them as your axioms, others as your definitions, and then prove the conclusions you divide them up. You have a structure of premise, reasoning, conclusion in the theory of triangles. This will now include a theory of straight lines. Having constructed a theory of triangles, now you can ask how about constructing a theory of rectangles and then a theory of squares which will be included in a theory of rectangles. Then you can see, okay, you can now combine theory of triangles, rectangles, pentagons, etc., quadrilaterals, into a single theory of polygons. And most of the properties of triangles will come from properties of polygons. You don't have to prove these theorems separately. So you have a theory of polygons. And then you can ask, what about circles? What are the properties of circles? Go through the exactly the same exercise. Axioms, definitions, conclusions. So now you have a theory of polygons and a theory of circles. Now you can have an integrated theory, a unified theory of polygons and circles and their relations. You have something that resembles a theory of geometry. And one of the exercises that we went through yesterday was, suppose you take <coughs> this proposition which can be reformulated as no straight line when extended will meet itself. That's one proposition. Let's change it into every straight line when extended will meet itself. You are free to make these adjustments. You are setting up your assumptions as your premises. What would be the logical consequences of that assumption if you say every straight line when extended will meet itself. It will be very different from Euclidean geometry because you have changed your axioms. Well, you will get the conclusion that the sum of angles in a triangle is more than two right angles. It can be up to three right angles. That is a startling conclusion. And for, the, for people who have not made that connection what I am suggesting is moving from flat geometry to spherical geometry. So, you can then say, what we are trying to do is to change your assumptions and see the relation between your assumptions and the conclusions that you derive. The truth depends upon the assumptions that you make. Now, you might ask, all this is about math. How, how is that relevant to anything else? How is this relevant to, let us say, biology? How is it relevant to, let's say, ethics? It's the same. It's the same structure that you're going to get in all these disciplines. Okay, so let me ask you this question: um, Think of a friend of yours and list the properties of that person, and you're going to have, uh, let's say, your friend is Zeno. Zeno has two eyes, Zeno has uh, a nose with two nostrils, Zeno has a mouth, Zeno has two hands, two legs, torso, etc., etc. Zeno has curly hair, he has a moustache, he, he, his color of the hair is black, color of the eyes is black, etc., etc. Now, notice that most of these statements are derivable from, as in the case of mathematics, they are derivable from the statement that Zeno is a human being. And then you list the properties of humans. All humans have two hands, two legs, eyes, etc. But you can't derive Zeno's curly hair and black hair from properties of humans. Some properties you can derive, some properties are specific to Zeno. 
with some, of course, degree of variability, permitted variability. Then you ask, what if I say Zeno is a, sorry, all humans are primates? List the properties of primates. And you can derive many properties of humans from the properties of primates. Of course, whether or not you have a tail is a separate issue. And then you say primates are vertebrates. And you have a theory of vertebrates from which you can derive the properties of primates and also the possible variability. Again, you go through the same exercise. Then you say a vertebrate uh, is a multicellular organism, multicellular animal organism. Again, you can get many properties from that statement. And then you can see ultimately that multicellular organisms are living organisms. What are the properties of living organisms? At that point, you have a theory of life. Okay? You have a theory of a particular theory of biology based on a classificatory system. And you will notice if you start stating a theory of life in this sense, most of the propositions that you're going to construct are about the functions, not about the structure, the anatomical structure. This will be a functional theory of life. And if you go down the classificatory tree, you will get gradual manifestation of the functions into anatomical structures. So, for example, you might say that all living organisms have the property that they take material from outside and create structure inside. This will be true of bacteria, this will be true of humans. But the way in which you do these things, what do you take from outside and what kind of structure you create will be different. So here is a way of using the same strategy of using these, uh, sorry, the things that I erased, the same tools of inquiry to create knowledge that will apply to mathematics, to biology, to physics, to philosophy, it doesn't matter which. These are essentially strategies that cut across disciplinary boundaries. What you would call transdisciplinary strategies. Let me write that. Transdisciplinary means not restricted to any particular discipline, cutting across disciplinary boundaries. So there are these particular disciplines like physics, chemistry, biology, philosophy, sociology, etc. Then there is a level of transdisciplinarity that is above the level of particular disciplines or even discipline groups. And things that exist at that level, at that abstract level, are transdisciplinary structures and transdisciplinary processes. What I've listed earlier are transdisciplinary in the sense they're not restricted to any particular discipline. So let me give you an example. Skeletal structure is part of biology. Structure of a poem is part of literary criticism or literary studies. Structure of a sentence is part of linguistics. Structure of a molecule is part of chemistry. Structure of an atom is part of physics. What is structure a part of? It's not part of any discipline, okay? It's, it is a transdisciplinary concept. Same way, respiratory system is part of biology. What is system a part of? That is not part of any particular discipline. That's a transdisciplinary notion. Function, organization, theory, correlation, these are all concepts which exist at this level, but they, they also enter into these levels with special meanings. So if you focus on these transdisciplinary concepts of knowledge, transdisciplinary concepts of inquiry, transdisciplinary tools of inquiry, you learn how to understand any discipline, how to do research in any discipline, because you can move from one domain to another effortlessly. 
And that ability to learn any discipline effortlessly, to create knowledge in any discipline, is part of your academic intelligence. And you will not acquire that intelligence if you get only specialized knowledge in one discipline or two. You have to exist at a transdisciplinary level to develop academic intelligence that cuts across disciplinary boundaries. So you will be, it doesn't matter whether you specialize in biology or in chemistry or in philosophy, you will be able to function reasonably well in any discipline. You will be able to listen to a philosophy lecture and ask meaningful intelligent questions, whether you are a mathematician or a chemist or a you know, historian, doesn't matter. That is the most important part of, as I see it, that is the most important part of education. The rest are details. Of course, I'm not saying that depth is not important. Depth is extremely important. What I'm saying is depth is not sufficient. You also have to have the ability to move across disciplines. You must have the toolkit of academic intelligence at a transdisciplinary level to have the capacity to learn any discipline and to function like a researcher in any discipline. You may have done specialization in, let us say, physics, but if you want to do biology later after your PhD, you need this intelligence to move from physics to biology or from biology to philosophy or from philosophy to physics. Okay. Um, I've talked, my intention was to have a dialogue with you, but I found it a little difficult because of people sitting at the very back when they had actually the choice of sitting here. So, but I will now either pause or stop and invite questions. I, I suggest that you come forward so that what you say over there, two kilometers away, will be heard by people here too, without, without, even without the mic. Can you come forward? Okay. That looks a little more like a friendly gathering. Um, so, questions? Sir, say you. On your right. Sir. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Sir, so my question is, suppose I want to limit myself to a certain number of disciplines. So, how do I identify the transdisciplinary structures relevant to those disciplines? Yeah. Okay, there are two, two things here. One is, if you are asking this question as a student, I think just as, for example, you have to be initiated into one discipline by a person who is familiar with it, you will have to be initiated into transdisciplinary skills and transdisciplinary concepts from somebody who has done that job or a textbook on transdisciplinary knowledge. Uh, you can, even if your knowledge is only about two or three disciplines, we can still understand on the basis of those disciplines what transdisciplinarity means. For the people who are going to create this knowledge, for the people who are going to teach transdisciplinary academic intelligence, they will have, they would need much more breadth. So they cannot afford to say, I am only a philosopher, I have no interest in mathematics or chemistry. I am only a chemist, I have no interest in biology or in uh, mathematics. So people who are involved in transdisciplinary education, the educators would need sufficient breadth. But students may not be, students would need some degree of breadth. But during the early stages, so in the, some of the courses that we teach, at least in the school level, or also in the research course that I teach at Raisa Pune, uh, students cannot say, I am interested only in mathematics, not in biology. Or I am interested only in biology, not in philosophy. They don't have that option. Some rudimentary abilities, some rudimentary concepts of all of these, which is what is done in the school education up to the 10th grade. You don't have a choice, you have to cover all these things. The same thing applies to a transdisciplinary education. This is a kind of general education of the kind that is practiced in many universities in the United States where you are required to have some breadth, you are not allowed to have too narrow specialization, you have to combine depth and breadth at the same time.
other questions yeah academic knowledge is simply understanding uh, take for example the knowledge of physics that is different from a set of abilities knowledge would mean simply understanding of that body of information uh, but when it comes to abilities what are the thinking abilities that you typically find associated with a physicist thinking like a physicist that's part of your academic intelligence knowledge of mathematics is related to but not exactly the same as thinking like a mathematician so what are the abilities what are the characteristics of thinking that you associate with mathematicians what are the mental capacities that you associate with ph philosophers these are parts of the intelligence so if you acquire these abilities ability to think like a mathematician ability to think like a theoretical scientist ability to think like an experimental scientist ability to think like a philosopher like a historian then you are actually enhancing your mental capacities and by practicing those mental capacities you you strengthen your mind your mind becomes more agile more refined stronger and so on and so on in other words you become more intelligent not necessarily uh, in every respect so for example your intelligence for music may not increase only this is a specific kind of intelligence if you want to uh, have the intelligence to sing like bhim sen joshi this is not going to help you but the kinds of uh, intelligences associated with academia in formal education those things you can increase so the shift is from knowledge oriented education to intelligence oriented education that uh, credibility is an important part of knowledge that like defines if it's knowledge or not like so what do you know but you don't believe in like there may be something that you know but you and you understand but you don't believe in does does it not form a part of the knowledge um for example take take this uh, statement that there are seven days a week you know that if i ask you the question do you believe it what is the justification for believing that there are seven days a week your answer will be this is just a convention all right and there is no need for understanding there are 12 inches in one foot this is just a convention there are 24 hours in a day just a convention but now supposing i said there are 365 days a year that's not a convention because that's a statement about the relation between days and year or other words it's a relation between the earth's rotation and the earth's revolution that is not a matter of social convention that is where you need understanding so when i say there are two, 365 days a week oops 365 days a year if you do not see that this is a relation then you don't fully understand it you are taking it as a kind of convention which can be reproduced in an examination but you don't understand it but that is not sufficient you can ask why should i believe that there are 365 days a year in other words why should i believe that the earth revolves 365 times during the time of revolution now for that you need to understand some facts associated with revolution so why should i believe that the earth revolves around the sun for that you need to know that this is related to for example the temperature cycle the temperature goes up and down in each day this is explained by rotation the temperature also has a yearly cycle summer and winter that is because of the revolution combined with the tilt i'm going through this fairly quickly and then you have to ask can those things be explained in terms of the geocentric theory for example summer and winter can you explain that in terms of uh, ptolemy's geocentric theory now your understanding increases notice none of that was relevant for the statement that are 24 hours a day or 7 days a week so one kind of knowing is this information level here right so uh, 
you know that the Greeks believed that uh, lightning and thunder were created by Zeus, a god. You know that in the sense that's a piece of information that you are aware of. Do you believe that proposition? No, you don't. But that is at the level of information. Your belief is not entering into the picture. There is no judgment of truth in those cases. You are simply aware of it. But if you bring in truth, then you have to ask, why should I believe that? That's where the critical understanding comes in. And you have to ask, when somebody tells you that water is an, ele water is a, an element or somebody else tells you water is a compound, you have to ask, why should I believe that? Two authorities tell you opposite things. Why should you accept one authority rather than another? Or air is a mixture. Why should you believe that air is a mixture? Because the Greeks, ancients said air is an element. Or take this. All of us believe that there is air in this room. Supposing I were to say, I don't believe that. Of course, you know that that statement is not true. But suppose I take that position. How will you convince me that air exists in this room? Let's try this. It's not easy. I don't believe that air exists in this room. Convince me that my belief is wrong. Yeah. Uh, sir, um, flies cannot uh, fly in vacuum or near vacuum conditions. So what? Just, flies what? cannot fly in near vacuum conditions. Yeah, but what do you mean? That is uh, not true so because a fly can fly here. This yes. is a vacuum. No, so I'm saying this is not a vacuum. Then. But you're asserting that. This is what I want you to convince me. Uh, you can't assert Okay. But I'll show you an experiment where I okay. So you will I will have to make you believe that I am creating a vacuum. And you can actually do all that stuff without going to a laboratory. Try that. Think of evidence for the assertion that there is air in this room. Yeah. Oh. Ah. So if if I turn on the fan, something something rotates there, and I experience something here. Ah. Okay. So I, I can see that there is a connection between what you're saying and this thing that you call air. So the fan produces air. So if you do this, hold on, I'm trying to explain, give you an alternative explanation. If I do this, I can have a sensation on my skin. So I know that my mouth produces air. My mouth also produces saliva. If I open my mouth, it will drip on my hand. But I'm not saying there is saliva in this room. Right? Yeah? Uh -huh. I am sorry, I didn't hear. Yeah, but I am I am treating air exactly like saliva. The fan produces air, and my mouth produces air. If I do this, it produces air, and I can feed that skin. But there is no air in this room unless something, some motion or something produces it. Uh, excuse me, sir. Oh yeah, in the center. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, Actually, when you breathe, you can feel that something is entering your lungs because your lungs expand. There is a sensation. Yeah, yes. there is a sensation. So you have to like uh, agree that you are breathing in something. Yeah. Right. I, that's an interesting, interesting piece of evidence that you say. So I said, I said earlier that my mouth produces air. Yeah. Now I can understand how it produces air by doing something with my lungs. It comes out through my mouth. Thank you for that. <laughs> I know, but uh, you are inhaling something, right? Inhaling. What do you mean inhale? You're, you're, you're taking in something from the environment and if you change your environment, if you maybe so go to... I can to feel the sensations on my chest when I do this. Yeah, but uh, that doesn't mean that something is coming from outside into my lungs. But uh, if, you, if you block your nose, you can't do that. Right. So I can't expand my lungs if I do this. Yeah. yeah. So that, so that could... doesn't mean there is something out in the air. Okay, it's but... Okay. Look, this is... Uh, uh, this exercise is to meant to show you. I am pretending that I don't believe it, but of course you know that I believe it. This is a way of justifying some of the things that you take for granted by taking the opposite position. So this was an exercise in the difficulty of coming up with proof, not proof in the mathematical sense, but evidence and arguments for the beliefs that we have. Okay. Quite often we take these as granted. And questioning what we take for granted is an important aspect of academic intelligence. Because it is only when you question what we take for granted 
then we can produce new knowledge. And quite often, we are indoctrinated by our prior beliefs. And we have to question the grounds that we are standing on. And then interesting new knowledges come to exist. And even things like this, it is important that you question that there is air in this room. For example, you, you have been taught that um, all species on this, uh, on this earth came from a single ancestor species, evolved from a single ancestor species. I don't believe a word of it. Every species came independently. How will you convince me that this is not the case? I think to have that dialogue, we will take about five hours. And if we have that dialogue, by the end of the dialogue, you will see that many of your beliefs are actually unjustified. But certain, some core of Darwinian theory, you are justified in believing. How much should you accept and how much you, you should doubt will come out through that dialogue. And it is important to have that dialogue. You cannot simply accept what the textbooks say. If you accept what the textbooks say, your knowledge will be limited. You will not be making a contribution to knowledge as a researcher because you will be only adding to the existing piece of knowledge, not restructuring existing knowledge. And it's important to restructure it. For that, it is important to doubt and question everything, every ground that you're standing on. Of course, you may not be able to disprove everything that you're standing on, but it's important to go through that exercise. That's what the rational temper our Indian constitution talks about the scientific temper, but generalizing we say rational temper. And that includes doubting and questioning what we believe to be true. There is a movie, I don't know if you have seen that, there is a movie called Agora. This is about a 4th century mathematician, scientist, philosopher called Hepesha, a woman scientist. And in the climax of the movie, she tells her colleagues, a Roman administrator and the bishop, saying, we are fundamentally different. You do not and cannot doubt what you believe. I must. This is her responsibility to doubt what you believe. That is a difficult job because when you believe something, how can you doubt it? But that is the essence of being an academic, you must leave room for doubt. Never be completely certain of anything. But you, you also believe it. That subtle balance between belief and doubt is acquired only through a great deal of practice of inquiry of this kind. Hello, sir. Can you elaborate on the structure of primary and high school uh, school system in the country? And uh, would you elaborate on the improvements that you may suggest? Okay. Thank you. The, uh, there is no difference between primary and secondary education as far as the existing system is concerned. Right from beginning to end, it's simply providing of information and memorization of information in, as a form of indoctrination. So, for example, uh, people are taught the heliocentric theory that the Earth revolves around the Sun in class 5, I think, or in some cases even class 3. They have no idea what it means, okay? Now, our experience tells us that the earth is completely stationary, it doesn't move. And what the teacher is saying or what the textbook is saying is, is something that is contradictory, contrary to our experience. A few years ago, there was um, when uh, we had a friend whose son was about 7 years old, and when we visited him, he was jumping up and down and looking down. He was jumping as high as possible looking down. And he was repeatedly doing that. So we asked him, Ernest, what are, you, what are you trying to do? Why are you jumping? So Ernest said, his teacher had told him that the earth revolves and goes around the sun very high speed. And he was jumping to see if, if he jumped up, the earth is moving, he should be landing somewhere else. So I asked him, so what do you think? Was the teacher right? He said, nah, earth doesn't move. Perfect answer, okay, for a seven-year-old. He should not believe the teacher. This was doubting the teacher. And Ernest is now a physicist. He, has a, he got his PhD a year ago. An excellent physicist. 
this that temperament of the rational temper was with him when he was 7 years old and that should be there in primary education and you should not tell them things that they cannot evaluate so the statement that the earth revolves around the sun is meaningless for a primary school student it should not be introduced until you are in at least class 8 because to to go through the evidence it takes a certain amount of intellectual maturity so if i were designing secondary school education heliocentric theory will be introduced only in class 8 and at that time students will have the choice of deciding what to believe whether the earth goes around the sun or the sun goes around the earth they will make the decision on the basis of available evidence so that will be a rational conclusion not dogma imposed by somebody else that ought to be the difference but it is not uh, when credibility truth or belief comes in the picture doesn't that make knowledge as an entity a bit subjective uh i am not sure what you mean by subjective but a judgment knowledge is you judge something to be true on the basis of evidence and arguments or only arguments as in the case of mathematics that is so knowledge is dependent upon the knower so i would say something like for me i am justified in saying that the earth revolves around the sun because i have gone through the evidence and have made a decision that this is this is a better version but do secondary school students know that the earth revolves around the sun no they do not because they are not aware of the evidence it's just a it's just a sentence so in that sense yes there is a subjective element in knowledge in the sense that you say yes to a proposition if you don't say yes to a proposition that is not knowledge for you it may be knowledge for somebody else and that cannot be avoided and if you think that knowledge is something that exists independently of the knower in some absolute sense like some kind of god that is not academic knowledge academic knowledge is a body of propositions that academics judge to be true on the basis of evidence on the basis of arguments on the basis of rational justification it is not simply a set of doctrines or dogma that's important and this knowledge that we regard as academic knowledge is never completely certain please join me in thanking professor mohan for an exciting lecture and uh, discussions and now i would request our uh, registrar mr k satyamurthy to kindly hand over the memento to the speaker they have statue thank you sir